Hey folks, it's been a long time since I've done a Scotty Kilmer video, so um, I jumped on his channel, kind of picked the first one I've seen, um, which unfortunately was some regurgitated content that he likes to often do. Um, but hey, there's, I think there's something on there I hadn't seen, hadn't reacted to, so let's go, let's see what old Kilmer has to say. He says it starts hard when it's cold, but it's okay when it's warmed up. I know nothing about this car. He knows nothing. He just bought it. So let's start to figure why doesn't it start up right away. So we'll open the hood. Yeah, no, we're not going to do this one. I've already done this one. Uh, I'll post it up in the um, corner there. Uh, and the video I've actually done on this one here where I pretty much just ripped this completely apart and just kind of show how Scotty's actually given dangerous advice as well as uh, incorrect and wrong advice. So let's move on to the next one. Now in the case of this Mercury Grand Marquis, the coolant is leaking down the front where the radiator is. So, we'll take this plastic shield out of the way. Then we'll get a flashlight and start looking around. Realize the radiators are made out of aluminum, even they're called plastic radiators because they have plastic ends. And as we look around, we can see there it's leaking. And right there, somebody attempt to fix it using... Alright, so that one there is pretty much just a pretty much simple, basic uh, diagnosis and fix. I mean, anybody with half an eye and a flashlight could probably just pretty much see that was leaking, and it's a pretty basic just throw the, you know, rip the old radi radiator out, put the new one in, um, bleed the system, and call it a good day. Um, further basic and not really worth going into. Um, that's pretty much all he does is he just slaps a radi cheap ass radiator at it. They got a pet boys, and um, he sends it on its way. So let's uh, move on to the next one. Let's start with the basic analysis of an overheating vehicle. And of course, the first thing to do is to check the coolant. If it's low on coolant, it could easily cause the problem at low speeds. It could not overheat at high speeds, but overheat at low speeds because as you're spinning the engine faster, the coolant goes through the system quicker. And even if you're a little low, it'll still work okay. But at idle, it won't. So, these crazy systems. The real radiator pressure cap is here. So first. All right, first thing he should have done there is just to give more just some general advice. Since uh, somebody tried to point out in one of the previous videos that Scotty gears a lot of his videos towards the uneducated and the uninitiated and people who are not trained. So the very first thing he should have done there is one, make sure the system isn't hot and pressurized. And two, remove the cap. You want to have a reg over top of it. And then remove it at a very slow pace to make sure any pressure that may be in there um, he's released at a very slow and controlled rate where you can tighten it back down. If you don't, then, and that, and that engine's hot, that, or that coolant system is hot and pressurized, um, even if it's been sat for a little while, then you're going to have hot coolant flying straight out of there like a bloody geyser, and it's going to scald you and anybody around you. And I've seen this happen. I've seen this happen to train mechanics who just weren't thinking uh, at the time. And I've seen it happen to more untrained people who just didn't know. And this is whip off a train. You know, that's a pressurized tank there it's got an expansion tank uh it's used a lot more in more modern vehicles they don't have a direct access to the radiator more it's more buried and they use a remote system like uh, an expansion tank there which is pressurized and will have hot coolant in it so the very first thing he should have done is just give a quick dis disclaimer so you make sure you and the system isn't pressurized system isn't hot uh, and uh, also to um make sure to remove that cap at a slow control rate to make sure any pressure any hot coolant is uh is can be controlled and released at a very um, control, controlled and um, and manageable speed so that if it does try to burst out, you can tighten it down real quick. And normally if you have a rag over top of it, it will stop any coolant from flying up. It'll push it down. It'll save your hand for a second so you can tighten it back down without scalding your hand. So instantly he should have done that. Um, if he's trying to gear this kick channel, which I imagine for people who don't know, then he really needs to make sure to kind of uh, emphasize any kind of safety issues and give senior safety warnings for people who may not know this. First thing we do is take that off. You can see it's full inside. This cap is to check the radiator. As you can see, it's not a regular radiator cap. It doesn't have a spring or anything. And you see it's not a regular radiator cap and doesn't have a spring. Actually what happened, what the springs were used for in the older systems where it was a radiator cap on top and the springs actually had a pre certain pressure. It usually be like something like 20 PSI, 15, 20 PSI. And it happens if the if the system overpressurized, that spring will come up and allow <clears throat> sorry, allow coolant to flow into the into the reservoir into the expansion tank. That's what it's usually called an expansion tank because it would allow 
go in there and then if the system also needs this um, stuff it it build up pressure and it can allow um coolant to go back in uh so those actually technically would actually be in pressure under pressure now i know you're gonna move to the cap first and most likely any pressure would have gone through that but once again um I think if you like I said, if he's somebody who's like 50 some years and, and he's been doing this channel for a while, you think you just throw a little bit of a caution to anybody who's taking this off, come with favorite this of the cap, taking this off, <clears throat> just know that if you've had the engine running, it's going to, it could be pressure in there and it could cause cool, hot coolant and stuff to come up to, uh, and to make sure that the, the pressure has either been released or to be extremely caution, ca careful and cautious, uh, or let the engine sit until the engine is completely cooled the rate right down. Uh, uh, and uh, all pressure has been released. So you can check pressure quite easily by just squeezing the top um, radiator hose and feel if it's hard, it's got pressure, or if you feel it feels a lot softer. And then you know that the pressure has uh, died back down and stuff like that. Normally, it's when the engine's cold, then you're absolutely fine. So I just think that he should um, give these little tips and little warnings just for you know people who may not know this stuff. I think it's just a cat. And as we see, it's pretty much full inside there too. Now I asked the owner, has he had to add coolant to the system, antifreeze water mix? And he said no. We know it's not leaking. Normally, the next thing I'd do would be a pressure test of the coolant system with my pump system, but really, he said he's not losing any coolant. If you got a leak, you're gonna lose coolant. So the system's sealed. There's not a problem with that. And next, normally I'd do one of these combustion leak tests where I'd put the blue liquid in here, run the engine, and see if the blue turns yellow showing that there's exhaust gas and the radiator showing a blown head gasket or cracked head just a little quick um side note on that using those i have used those in the past and they have been good and have worked um but i also have seen where sometimes that fluid is just not enough, enough hydrocar hydrocarbons or the fluid just doesn't react enough that um to actually indicate that the head actually is gone um that's usually good for a quick indicator quick test um, I would find usually a better one, but obviously requires a uh, mechanic with a lot more money and, uh, and equipment is to actually get a hydrocarbon tester where you can test it goes on top of there and it'll test for any CO2, CO, uh, any hydrocarbons, any, um, uh, any other stuff that is in the coolant that shouldn't be. You can usually use it for um, the same thing you'd use for doing the exhaust emissions tests. You can use the same thing so it'll, it'll pick up the same stuff. And then you know um it's normally almost 100 percent if you can if you have one of those a hydrocarbon tester and it's using the machine that tells you in digital display and, and it, it's much more sensitive and if you can see any tiny bit of hydro, hydrocarbons in there then normally that's that's almost guaranteed that's going to be a, a head gasket the system that little tester he has there if it's not enough, enough hydrocarbons there is a head gasket leak but it's not enough there's not putting enough hydrocarbons into the um, cooling system then sometimes that fluid doesn't always react the way it should uh so i just say that it's, it's okay stuff but i wouldn't i wouldn't rely on it 100 uh, percent sometimes you can get some iffy results with that stuff but um as he's pointed out it's pointless doing that because the customer has complained about losing any coolant he hasn't uh, complained about any kind of weird uh, exhaust smoke out in the back normally white smoke indicates that you have a, a coolant leak and he's not really hot and he's probably not indicating any kind of like um have you know cool it other or, or built massive build this a pressure right, right away another good way is to have the engine cold sit there um do up everything for the uh, cooling system stir it up uh let it idle for a minute if that and open and then open the um expansion tank if you have like exhaust gases building up almost right away that's also another good indicator i'm not saying 100 percent but it's a good indicator that the um that there is a um head gasket leak because it's what you're having um extra pressure being pushed into the cooling system that shouldn't be there cooling system should build pressure slowly and gradually and shouldn't be building pressure instantly spiking up right away but if a head gasket's gone and it's pushing hydrocarbons into the um into the cooling system and it's building up pressure much faster than it should uh so that's also another way of doing it if you don't have that kit the car overheats with the ac on and idling for long periods of time if so right there, um, that he's just pretty much said exactly what's wrong with the vehicle. Um, the customer, and that's sometimes where it's really good to, um, if you're either a mechanic and you're trying to learn, um, is question the customer, get as much information as you can off them, or get your, um, your service advisor or service manager to ask any questions. The more, more questions you can ask, the more information you can gather off the customer. Sometimes it can help get you to know exactly what's wrong. Um, normally the best thing he should, he should have done, and uh, anybody who's trained in this or trained in the trade is, is confirm the customer's complaint. 
the first thing you should have done is got in there, done, put it to the, what the customer said, idling a long time, AC on, then it starts to overheat, and try to just watch, watch the indicator go up, or it goes past center, if it's starting to overheat, shut it down, okay, confirmed, this is what the customer is complaining. Now you can um, try that and try the AC off, or turn the AC off and see what happens. See, does that, does that suddenly change? Then you know it has to do with the AC system and not so much the engine idling. An engine, if you turn the AC system off and you watch this, uh, the coolant go down, you know that there's going to be a fault with the AC system and there's something going on there where the AC system is actually, you know, is is pumping heat into the um, in, in, in engine or radiator or that the engine's working way too hard and, uh, and it's something, uh, something's up with air conditioning. <clears throat> So right there, him just saying that it only seems to happen when it's idle for a long time and when AC is on. So that's kind of, um, I kind of, right there from there, I know, all right, this is most likely that this is related to an AC problem. It's not so much an engine problem, uh, especially if you ask a customer and they say, well, if the AC off, does it overheat? And they go, nope, runs fine, perfectly good. Never, you know, something might have AC on. All right, then you know the AC is issue. Same thing with you if you don't know, but if you know, if you know that you take it to a customer, a mechanic, you don't know and you say it only happens when the AC is on, air conditioning is on, then you know that most likely this is going to be something to do with an air conditioning problem that is affecting the engine to cause it to either have heat that shouldn't, that isn't being dissipated correctly or where it's causing maybe where the engine is having to work and it's building, it's having to work too hard at idle to, um, and it's building up too much heat. But I kind of have an idea what's going on with this already. If it was a blowing head gasket, the faster you go, the worse it'll get. The faster you go, there's more pressure, the engine's spinning faster, it would build the exhaust gas up even faster, and it would overheat worse at high speeds than at idle. So if it's a blowing head gasket, it wouldn't have as much problem at idle, it would have a worse problem at high speed. And in this case, at high speed, it has no problem at all. So. We know it's not a blown head gasket. It would be much worse the faster you go. So something's up in the system that doesn't leak. Now, maybe it's a stuck thermostat. The thermostats when they're cold like this one, you can see it's stuck shut. As the engine heats up, it opens up and lets coolant from the radiator get into the engine to cool the engine. It's to warm them up faster. If it's stuck shut, it won't send any coolant to the engine from the radiator and it'll overheat, but when they're stuck shut, they overheat pretty fast, and then they just stay overheated. And again, same as if the head gasket was blown. If you have a stuck thermostat, it'll overheat at low speeds, but it will overheat even worse at high speeds, because you need more coolant spinning through the fast spinning engine to dissipate all that heat from the engine running at higher RPMs. It would overheat like mad if it was stuck at high speeds, and then... Just kind of on that note, now, um, if a thermostat is is stuck completely shut, like not opening whatsoever, completely failed, then um, yeah, the engine's gonna overheat no matter what. Obviously, you put more stress to the engine, you're causing more heat, it's working harder, it's gonna overheat quicker. But I have seen where sometimes thermostats are partially shut, um, stuck shut, where they're opening up part way. And in those cases, I've actually seen where the, when, the, when you get going down the road, the engine actually starts to cool down and only starts to heat up when idling and what's happening is because idling you're not getting the airspeed um, going past the air, cooling the engine down. And when you're getting some coolant flow going past the thermostat, you're not getting enough. And so it does start to climb. But when, I, when you get moving forward, you're getting more airflow through the engine, through the radiator. You're actually bringing the engine, the temperatures down. And that little bit of flow that it's getting is getting enough. They'll actually start to bring the, down, the engine temp down. So um, him saying that is like only if it's stuck completely shut, but most of the time I've seen when a thermostat is stuck, it's actually sticking partially shut and or it's only opening up partially, however you want to put it. Um, and in that case there, you'll actually get the exact opposite of what Scott is saying, where um, when you're going down the motor, uh, highway, um, then the, the engine will actually cool down and run more operating temperature, especially if you're just lumbering along, just cruising along, because you're getting all the airflow past the engine and you're getting, and, and the cooling, the coolant is going past, it's just enough that it's able to cool that engine and keep operating temperature. But as soon as you stop, the temperature starts to climb up again. And that's where you have a partially stuck uh, thermostat. And um, and they say, you get the opposite of what he's saying. So not always is it that the thermostat being stuck shut will cause that, uh, where it'll climb faster when the engine is being used. Uh, because the thermostat stuck shut, if you're sitting moving or not moving, but if you just simply just raise the RPM of the engine, the engine can heat up faster, it's working harder. You're not getting you're not getting any flow whatsoever. It's a completely blocked system, and normally you can't even get that. Is if you 
if you can if you can get access to your um, the coolant hoses in a safe manner you're not gonna get stuck in your belts or anything or the fan and you can touch one and be stone cold one and be smoking hot it's usually a good idea not getting any flow <clears throat> and actually the um, a a water pump that's completely failed to the impeller in the water pump and I have seen that some vehicles have like a plastic water pump uh, impeller on a, on a metal shaft or the water pump just fails completely and I have seen that where you actually get the same um, you'll get the same symptom as the thermostat being stuck completely shut and that's the same symptom because it's just lack of flow so that can actually be another thing where um, the engine will overheat especially at higher high RPMs and that would tend to be at higher RPMs uh, you will get some flows because the thermostat will still open up and you get um, the, th uh, the, th it'll, the thermal uh, convection will still move through and that may work at, at, uh, at um, like highway speeds so the engine will still cool because it's simply opening up and you're getting some um, flow just through the hot and cold just that the, um, the coolant is just simply conducting itself but you'll still have it pretty much act in the same way with the, the, if the thermostat being stuck shut because you still get no flow and um, that thing can still happen there. In this case, at high speeds it runs totally normal. What can it be? Well, it could be the fans aren't working right to cool the engine. So I'll start it up, turn the AC on, and we'll check the speed using our wind speed indicator. You can use your hand too, I mean. I can feel a lot of air coming out of here. Now this thing is rated at 5.68 miles per hour at idle, it's 5.67. That's certainly close enough. And really for those of you without one of these gauges, I mean, you can get it for 25 bucks on Amazon, but put your hand here. I feel a ton of air, that fan's blowing. But in this case, it's a mechanical fan. It runs off a water pump. Most vehicles these days have electric, one or two electric cooling fans instead of a mechanical one. Because they're more efficient, they work better, but you can test them the same way. Turn on the AC, make sure they're both blowing good. But in this case, I found out there's a flaw. The soldier who owns the car told me he was in a wreck and they didn't replace the condenser fan for the AC system. It's supposed to be a cooling fan in here. And as you can see, there isn't one. It's gone. But when you look closely, there's a lot of bugs stuck in there. So we're gonna clean those off first. So out comes my unbeatable Honda powered pressure washer. It's a Honda, so you know it's gonna start. I don't see how the I can see there's some bugs in there and obviously that condenser looks like it's been beat up a little bit with rocks and stuff that's hit the fins and they're all kind of bent up and stuff like that. It happens on them quite a bit. You know, it is low down. I live in an area where there's a lot of rocks that do a lot of gravel on the roads and stuff like that. They do, do get beat up pretty hard. You can get screens and stuff to go in the front of the, the lower part of the, uh, of the of the bumper or the radiator to kind of protect them. Um, that's here and there. What I would, uh, the only thing is I don't like, and it's going to be a little bit, a little bit anal here, is um scotty he's using his he's using his um uh pressure washer there and he's pushing the bugs into further in i personally it's just my own like you know me being a little bit anal or um pretty picky why doesn't he go from behind from down behind and try to push them out they've gone in this way they're blocking it push them out the way it came um, all he's really doing is just taking that pressure and he's just pushing them, jamming them further in, into the condenser and into the radiator further. Go from the back of the radiator, push them out because you're going to probably have some in the radiator, and then go from the back push and, and, and push them the opposite way. That's how we do. It makes a lot more sense just to kind of, you know, push them off the way that they're already sitting on there and then, you know, pushing them further in and just jamming stuff as well as you could be, um, you're pushing more stuff, pushing those fins tighter. And you're doing, you could actually end up doing a bit more damage and stuff like that. That's how we do it. Also, we can go straight on and I'll go, I'll go more of an angle so you're not actually having all that pressure that's hit, hitting that. I know he says he's using a low pressure end uh, on that, which is correct. You should be doing that. But I would actually go from the from the back to the front and push them out instead of trying to push them in. But that's just me. And um, I like, you know, the details is something I like to kind of, you know, make a difference at times. Can't be the pressure washer. And in this case, we're losing a lower pressure nozzle. You don't want too much pressure. To clean all the bugs off. And since it doesn't have the electric fan that goes on the condenser, which pushes the air through the condenser to cool the AC and helps push air through the radiator, which of course is behind the condenser, and make it work. So we're going to hook this thing up right in front of the condenser, then turn it on full blast. We want it on high. Then we'll go inside the truck, start it up. 
the TAC on full blast. There it is, research. And we'll see what happens to the temperature gauge. The flower was going up all the way up to that notch that's under the H. Now, it hasn't now here you are. This is apparently a mechanic who's got over 50 some years experience. And now he is decided now he's going to confirm the customer's complaint after he's already kind of diagnosed the looks of the vehicle and gone through a bunch of the tests. Um, any man, any mechanic, any technician uh, worth any of his salt would know he's just gone and done that completely in the wrong way. And um, I said, well, I don't know why he's decided to suddenly confirm the customer's complaint. He hasn't actually confirmed the customer's complaint. What he's done is he's figured out what's wrong with it, and he's confirming a um, proof of uh, proof of concept by putting the fan in front, starting it up, and seeing okay, now we have more engine, um, more airflow. Will this make a difference? But all he's really actually doing is doing the same thing as if he took the vehicle for a test drive and went hold. It's not it. It doesn't overheat when I'm moving because the airflow and it will ever stop and idle it, and then the temperature starts to climb up. It's the same thing, really. You don't need a big fan to do that. Um, it, all he's doing is emulate, emulating more airflow going through the radiator as if he's driving the vehicle. So that's kind of a pointless test. He already knows this. It's already been confirmed. He took it for a test drive and done that. Sat in a, in a parking lot. See the engine start climbing up. Uh, temp, temp, time uh, climbing up with the AC on. Go for a drive. Watch the AC. The temp start to drop back down. Turn the AC off. Go uh, sit in idle for again. Temperature stays fine. Then you know that you have confirmed it. Quick, easy, about 15 minute test. You, you would have confirmed proof of concept and proof to uh, customer's complaint, which is actually if anybody who actually knows what they're doing and was a professional, which I, I still have had my doubts. I don't think Scotty is a professional. I do think he's just a backyard mechanic uh, and he, um, who just likes to pretend on the internet. And uh, I think he's, uh, he's just, so that's why I think he gets all these diagnostic processes and everything all out of order or done in the wrong way because he actually doesn't actually doesn't really actually know that you know the most efficient and best way of doing things and how he really how I like to try to teach people and try to show and how I think he should especially if he has the experience he says he has. It damaged anything yet because it has to get to the age when it boils then it damages the engine. As long as it doesn't boil it hasn't damaged the engine yet so it hasn't done any damage we're going to let it sit for half an hour, 40 minutes, and check it every once in a while and see if it stays normal now. It sits so hot today at the end of July in Tennessee. I got a nice cool glass of water and a nice air-conditioned Nissan Titan and sit here for half an hour and watch it. Now, after 10 minutes, you can see it's still running good. Now, I can just about guarantee you that's the problem because it's logical. They didn't put the cooling fan for the condenser on after the wreck. It was designed that way. On the highway, yeah, you're going 60 miles an hour. You got 60 mile an hour wind, plenty enough to cool it off. But in the city, no. Especially when you're idling, it's gonna make it overheat, especially when you turn the AC on. The heat of the AC is ejected by the condenser that's in front of the radiator. So it puts a bunch of heat in front of the radiator. The condenser gets super hot. Then the air passes over the condenser and then since it's in front of the radiator that hotter air goes through the radiator. Well that extra heat is going to make it not work right if there isn't more wind pushing it through. And of course when you're going 60 miles an hour you got 60 mile an hour wind going through the condenser going through the radiator cooling it off. But I still don't trust anything so I'm going to wait half an hour to see if it changes. And in the meantime I can see his tire pressure monitoring system light is on. There it is. So we might as well check that. I can't just sit here drinking water cool off for half an hour. I'd be bored out of my mind. Here we go. Plug in the scan tool. You need a decent one to do TPMS. The really cheap ones won't help. We'll plug it in. There we Unfortunately, even the scan tool won't do the TPMS, so I need a better one. What the heck? I like trying out scan tools, seeing what works and what doesn't. So here's my new Think Car one that I've gotten recently. This new one is called Think Tool PD8. We'll see how it works. And it shows this doesn't do automatic detection. This particular model, they're blaming it on the manufacturer, so we'll have to put it in manually. We see the BCM has problems. It's got a code. Four of them. They all say low voltage. Weak batteries often do that. Even with all this information, if you notice, there is not a tire pressure monitoring service information on this scan tool either. So we're gonna do what I always have to do. I'm gonna have to get the actual tire pressure monitoring computer to check it out a TPMS checker well there's a life of a mechanic for you now I got out here my Autel Max TPMS 
and it plugs in. I always seem to get them upside down. There we go. That's plugged in. Now we'll see what this baby does. Here we go. We want to check it out. Yes, TPMS. Okay, what do we got? Nissan. Go up to Nissan. Diagnostics. Yes, yeah, taking an awful lot of time. The front left has low battery. The right rear has low battery. The right left has low battery. And there's no data from the front left. Now this is the problem with these stupid systems. Three of the four wheels have low voltage and one has none at all. Since the front left has no data at all, that means the front left sensor is either broken or its battery is completely dead. The other ones are warning that they're low. So here's how stupid it is. If you took it apart and replaced the front left one, the other three are low. They're gonna go out soon. They're all made at the same time, right? You'd have to replace all four. It costs a fortune. So I just say, get yourself a $10 little gauge to check your tire pressure with, the tire pressure gauge. Fixing this is gonna cost a ton of money to fix. Here Scotty goes again, over exaggerating prices, it took me all a five minute search and I found it for $20 a piece. So you could have those all fixed for um, about 80 bucks and then plus to install, which you install would probably be maybe an hour's labor. You know, turning the tires off, you just um, take the air out, bust a bead on the outside and out done. So probably an hour's labor plus $80, um, they're about $20 a piece on the order online in stock shipped to your door not that expensive scotty isn't that that expensive you need to stop over exag exaggerating on things that you just don't like or don't understand because you're a naughty boy that's not right and i've caught you out many many times on that before let's move on Fix it good, because if you change the front left one, sure, it'll start working. But then the other three soon are going to go out because it says their batteries are low. At least now you know how the stupid systems work. That you're going to need a really specialized tool to check them, not any, even a good scan tool. Most of them won't even read them. And I'll just live with this one. Well, it's been about 40 minutes now messing with those things, so let's check the overheating problem. Well, as we look at the gauge, it certainly is not overheating anymore. So, yeah, putting this fan in front to take place of the condenser fan that isn't there from the wreck fix the whole problem now the customer's a soldier he's pinching pennies so i told him i ah, don't go buy the super expensive nissan fan they want a ton for those things go to autozone o'reilly any discount auto parts store and get an electric fan mount it there put a toggle switch in the dash Put in a 20 amp fuse. You can turn it on when you want, when you're in traffic, turn it off on a highway. Who knows? It was wrecked in the front. Maybe it even damaged the computer. You might. That shows just how little Scotty actually knows about this vehicle because there's no way that computer would be damaged. It actually sits up by the firewall, then the firewall in front of the, um, the driver's side. Um, if that computer is wrecked, then that car would be in a complete and utter write off. And there's no way that computer would have had any damage to that. So uh, he's talking crap. As for his little Mickey Mouse fix of like just going to AutoZone, buying some Mickey Mouse friggin' generic um, electric fan, running a wire through with a fuse, toggle switch and going to the ground and messing around like that. For one, will that, will that fan fit the front end right? Probably not. So you're going to have to try to mount it in a certain way. You're going to end up causing loads, a lot more problems and stuff. You're going to have to take the bumper off and the front grill off just to get that. Then you have to run the wiring. Then you got to run obviously the fuse. You have to go to power, so you have to go from the you know, and get power to it, go through the switch, go through your fuse, go find the ground. You can have a toggle switch. And another problem with that is that if you it's going to be on a simple switch on, off, on, off, it's not going to uh, it's not going to be connected to any kind of computer. What's the um the CCM of that fan? Is it the proper fan for that uh for that uh, condenser? Will it push too much air and actually cause you to start having problems with the condenser starting to um have uh, problems inside where you're pushing too much air or is it still not going to do enough or is it going to actually block some you know it's it's just the vehicle isn't designed for that like i said also the mounting and stuff like that how you're going to mount it properly then like i said there's a problem if it's hardwired in you're going going through a fuse 20 amp fuse you're going you're going straight to a, uh, a switch and going to the ground what happens if you leave that on now you run the risk of actually having a fan that's going to be running all the time you happen to forget about it you kill your battery now you got a vehicle that keeps having dead battery uh, also, you're running um, like extra electrics and stuff like that. I have a much better idea, Scotty. And I know you're just a little brain just didn't even think about this. It's called the scrapyard. Okay? Go to the scrapyard. Go pull your condenser fan out of a Titan like that. 
there's pretty many there, you know, one, especially one that's maybe been a back end collision and stuff like that, you know, there's going to be nothing wrong. Take it out, put it in there, it'll mount up the way it should be, it'll plug straight into electrics and work perfectly the way you want to, it'll probably cost. After all the messing around and then having to buy all the extra wiring, try to run it through stuff like that, you probably end up being a lot cheaper. Go to a scrappy, get a used one. Most likely be fine, it won't cost you very much and it'll mount in there properly, run off the, all the current electrics, run off the computers, and do what it should be doing, and a fraction of the cost. So why he didn't say that, I don't know. But you know what? For a man who's been in the, in the industry for 50 years, he sure comes up with some stupid ideas. Might buy a new fan and hook it up the way it was set up and it won't work. You just get a fan, they're less than 100 bucks usually. Put a fan there, some wire, toggle switch, and a fuse. Then you got simplicity itself. Or go buy all the Nissan parts and spend a fortune. It's your choice. At least you know how you can fix them now.